clocks are now kind of irrelevant to me. Time, where it used to have kind of the linear progression feel to it, now feels more like a space. If you asked me when I was 17, you know, what I'd be doing with my life, I would have said, oh, I'd definitely be a writer. For me, literature was always a, a, a powerful reflecting tool for thinking about life. But found after I completed my undergraduate studies uh, and for the first time really thought about what I was passionate about, medicine was, in fact, the perfect place. In the life of a neurosurgery resident, time is linked to progress. And as the numbers on the clock increase, so too should your progress towards some goal. I first began noticing symptoms in my sixth year of residency. And so I ended up having a full body CT scan. And yeah, there were uh, metastatic lesions kind of all over the place. Obviously, Lucy and I were both very suspicious that I had some form of cancer, but actually having the confirmation was still devastating. And so we were in the hospital room, and we just kind of lived there and cried a little bit, and then called my parents, my brothers. After finishing chemotherapy, and coming out of the hospital and entering this recuperative phase and not working. The time is very different where I'm not thinking about how each 15 minutes is gonna to contribute to some greater productivity. Verb conjugation is particularly confusing for me for the verb to be. I finished neurosurgical training, so I am a neurosurgeon. I'm not practicing currently. If I get healthier, I plan on getting back into clinical medicine. So in that sense, I will be a neurosurgeon, or I won't, depending on how things go. And so I don't really know what the correct tense to use is. I am, I was, I will be, I had been. There's definitely a funny double sense I have at say, clinic visits. As a physician, you're constantly concerned about how far behind you're getting and how many patients you have to see. And the faster you can get through your appointments, the better. And so, you know, whenever I see a doctor, there's always an awareness in my head that a little clock in the back of their heads is ticking. Certainly, medical training is very future-oriented because it's all about delayed gratification. And so you're always thinking about five years down the line, what are you going to be doing? Five years down the line, I don't know what I'll be doing. I may be dead, I may not be. And so it's not all that useful to spend a lot of time thinking about the future beyond lunch. Since Katie's birth, my time with her has had a, a very peculiar and free nature. In all probability, I won't live long enough for her to remember me, or certainly not have any clear memory of me. And so, you know, the time is just is what it is, which is fun, because she's a really good baby. There is a disjunction in time between how I perceive time and how I perceive my daughter Katie's time because she's in this rapid phase of development, whereas my sense of time is very static. And so there is kind of a, 
inherent tension between those things, which, you know, sometimes when I'm reading a baby book or someone remarks, kids grow up so quickly, there's kind of a pang because I'm not gonna see most likely that growing up happen. And the faster Katie grows up, the, the faster I'm not there. At the same time, every day is an exciting, rewarding, meaningful time to spend with her. Hope is a very funny thing. Certainly as a doctor, I felt it was very important. And the way in which patients come to understand and make meaning of their diseases is one of the pillars of, of what matters about being a doctor. And the way hope functions for me now as a patient, it's a careful balance. If you don't think about the bad case, that ending is gonna be very rough on you and your family. But if you don't think about the good case, you're gonna miss an opportunity to really make the most out of, out of your, your life and time. I met a traveler from an ancient land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them. And the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone level sands stretch far away. Ozymandias. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing besides remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away.